who has access to what? If you are looking for identity and access management talk, you have come to the right place. This is the Identity at the Center podcast. Hosts Jeff Stedman and Jim McDonald are strategic advisors with Identropies Advisory Services Practice and are here to talk about a wide range of identity and access management topics. Comments, questions, and accolades can all be sent to identity at the center.com. And now, on to the show. So today we've got a special guest, Luis Almeida. He's VP of Business Development here at Identropy. And uh, we thought it would be interesting to have him on uh, to talk a little bit about how the value proposition of identity management has changed. And I know that this is something that's been near and dear to his heart uh, for a while. And we've also got Jim McDonald here too. Guys, you want to say hello? Hey guys, Jim McDonald here. Um, I'm really excited about having Luis on. Luis has been a veteran in our industry uh, for many, many years. I'm not going to steal his thunder by doing his introduction, but you know, he's worked at several identity and access management focused companies uh, in the past. And so he has a really good, unique perspective on the industry and he's really good at telling stories. So Luis, why don't you do a quick introduction of yourself? Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Jeff. Um, So it's for me, it's a pleasure to be here because um, the respect I have for the real practitioners in this space, right? And especially Jim and Jeff who have done it. They've been on the other side of the table, really managing programs and doing the hard work. Um, you know, so these are people that, that, that I have a great deal of respect for. I think, um, the really good salespeople are the ones that, um, try not to speak, try, try to give the customers a lot of space and listen. So, um, this is a little bit uncomfortable for me, but, but I'll do my best. And I, and I really appreciate the kind introduction guys. Yeah, no, I think this is a model uh, opening for all of our guests. If they can show the appropriate amount of deference to Jim and I, <laughs> everything's just going to go great. <laughs> yeah, and I really mean it. So, so thanks for having me. Yeah, but, no. um, you know, as Jim was saying, I've, I've been in the space really 15 years, over, the, over 15 years. Um, I got my start at CA back, at, back when it was Computer Associates. I was a storage guy. Um, really selling backups that, you know, you could do the backup, but then you couldn't restore, which was really a horrible business to be in. <laughs> and um, a good friend of mine, Mark Potter, who ran identity for the Southeast for CA at that time, he heard me on the phone banging away, trying to help customers. And he said, I want you to come join the security team. And I looked at him and said, I think you're crazy. There's absolutely no way. I know nothing about security. And I picked up the phone and kept dialing. And, and he insisted and it was the best thing that ever happened to me in my life. And um, so I was there for eight years. I was um, very successful selling SiteMinder and CA Identity Manager. And you know, we used to say we'd sell out of a hole because people weren't always pleased with their experience with CA. So we really had to work hard there. And after eight years, Mark left CA and went to join the team at Quest Software. He started the Identity and Access Management team, and I was his first hire at, uh, at Quest. And uh, that was kind of a, a risk for me because Quest had just acquired Volker Informatica, a German Identity and Access Management company. You know, We knew Quest as a tools company, AD management, and we went over there. And we actually did relatively well. We were there for, I was there for three years, and then we suffered through a process where Vinny Smith was going to take Quest private. Um, and then uh, Michael Dell said, no, you're not. We're coming in and buying you. Uh, Michael Dell's engine spoke louder. And um, we ended up going to work for Dell. And at Dell, you know, large, large sales organization. I felt identity was going to get lost in the shuffle. Identity being such a specific thing to sell in position that, that I left Dell and was fortunate enough to come join our team here at Identropy. I've been here five years. It's just been for me just a tremendous experience. And the reason for that is I think in the identity space, consulting services is so important. And, you know, the ability for us to listen to the requirements a customer 
has and to be able to position value beyond products, right? And looking at programs and, and the stuff the advisory team does is just, just easier. It's more flexible. We can be of more service. So, so that's it. That's, that's, that's my background. And, and here we are. Yeah, I think that's right. really interesting, Luis. You're there kind of in the, the early days of identity management and um, you know, the approach has changed so much over time. Um, and the vendor landscape has changed over time. I think that's been driven a lot by the, the value proposition for customers. And what I was hoping you could maybe talk about was kind of walk us through that history. So where were customers getting value of, and what was driving their investment, say 10 to 15 years ago and how's it changed over time? Sure. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat a big fan of the Gartner product hype cycle, right? So that's the curve that, you know, the, the product increases in hype over time. And then it, you know, dips down into a trough of disillusionment, starts to slowly go back up and then goes into the plateau of productivity. So I would say that I missed the upturn towards the peak. I really joined the identity space really at the peak of the hype. Right, that's when CA acquired Integrity. All these other acquisitions were going on, and and um, identity. They really weren't identity practitioners, really. I mean, but but people really had high hopes for identity. Um, and at that time, what we were telling customers is, and we believe this, and I, I think it's really important to say, you know, the people that I know that do well in sales and in, in service providing and, and helping others, you know, they come from a from a place of sincerity, right? The, the, the place is one of helping and you get paid and, and you're going to make money, but if your heart has to be in a, in a mode of helping. So I would go out to my customers when I first got hired and, 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 and try to help them. And what everybody expected that we were going to help them with was something called um, auto magic provisioning. Okay. We were going to give everybody um, access to the systems they needed programmatically uh, with the right permissions and entitlements across thousands of applications. And it was really an IT optimization value proposition. And it was something we were sure we were going to be able to do. We were all setting out to do it. And, um, you know, that really, it was a, it was a, it was a value around making people's jobs easier. And of course, enhancing security because you're, you're somewhat facilitating least privileged. And Louise, if I could jump in for a second, you know, the, these are the early days of Active Directory, right? So you're going mm -hmm. back around 0304 time frame. I think mm -hmm. Active Directory really started with Windows 2000. So mm -hmm. it took some time to get established. And within the enterprise walls, it wasn't like, you know, people set up Active Directory and they integrated 200 applications into it. So if you automated Active Directory, you're good to go on mm -hmm. you know, a large part of your IT landscape. Mm -hmm. uh, this was the days where applications, for the most part, each had their own username and password. Those usernames could vary, things like that. So for, from my recollection and kind of being in that space and being a, a practitioner, it was about, wow, we've got this wild west of, of access is being managed in different ways across different applications. And there was not a central identity store for the most part. Yeah, that, I do remember it that way. And, and, and the way I remember it really, the, to me, which is really symbolic of that time, were all the role engineering exercises, mm -hmm. right? Um, people would get locked in a conference room for years and Ernst & Young or Accenture, or whoever would come in and just do these huge role engineering exercises to create these buckets of permissions that then we would use to, to provision. Um, I was very fortunate back then that I met a good friend of mine, he's still a great friend of mine, him and Vimadalal, who's the CEO of Simeo today. And, um, you know, I, I linked up with him and the, you know, remember I was a storage guy. I didn't really know what I was talking about. So I'd let him do all the talking. And we always led with this concept of role engineering, right? You need to know, um, what you're going to provision. And, um, 
that's what we led with. And I think, Jim, you know, we weren't looking at groups, right? We were really looking at what were those entitlements permissions inside of the application. And it was very large services projects in a large enterprise. And um, they were very challenging. Yeah. And a lot of, um, a lot of mainframes, to be quite frank, you know, legacy systems, applications that were hard to integrate with. Yeah, that's, that was, that was my background. I, you know, when I was in first getting involved in IEM was with Walgreens way back when, and you know, there were four of us uh, who were responsible for creating mainframe accounts, uh, Lotus notes, email accounts, <laughs> which mm -hmm. is a total nightmare to try and do anything with when mm -hmm. it was IEM, as I found mm -hmm. out later on in my uh, career, but, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it was very, it was very account based and we hadn't even mm -hmm. considered really the concept of roles at that point. This would have mm -hmm. been, yeah, early, early 2000s mm -hmm. as we're going through that process. But um, it's funny, we didn't really even consider an IAM tool at that point, even though we were a, a, a fairly centralized team, there were still only four of us, you know, for this entire, you know, pharmacy chain, essentially mm -hmm. handling all the corporate and enterprise stuff. Um, you know, it took a few years as we started to really skyrocket from a access need perspective within the organization to recognize a need that, okay, we really need to start to figure out how we're going to scale because, um, you know, SLAs become a concern. And, you know, this is, this is back in the old days um, where, you know, it's Friday and we're all working out of one mailbox and there's literally nothing to do. Right. <laughs> so we're fighting over tickets to see who's going to grab it, who's going to grab the email because there's something to do because otherwise you're really kind of just sitting there. Uh, because the demand wasn't there, you know, flash forward a decade and, you know, you've got thousands of tickets in a queue and, you know, you're managing a group of people, but it really was kind of a very simple time from an IM perspective. And, and this conversation to me is really reassuring, right? Because we really didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> yeah. You know, we, we know. had a, yeah, we had, <laughs> we had a vision and, and we thought we knew where we were going and together we tried to solve problems, but what that time became was a graveyard of failed implementations yep. and unfulfilled promises and extremely disappointed customers. And, um, you know, and a lot of hardworking salespeople, a lot of hardworking consultants, they're trying to figure this thing out. That was the vision and it just wasn't working. And, you know, a couple of reasons for that, you know, you do your role engineering exercise. It took forever. Um, you tried to do implementations where it was, you know, big bang. You tried to do everything at once. Um, there wasn't this concept of, um, you know, delayed perfection, but what, what is it that Chad says all the time, you know, incremental progress, mm -hmm. which we really think about today. Um, so there's a lot of field implementations, a lot of money spent. And, you know, to this day, we still see, some remnants of that. I mean, there's some large organizations that are still suffering with a large investment sunk into an identity program that's connected to Active Directory. And that's it after, you know, five years, 10 years. So, mm -hmm. so that was a tough time for all of us, I think. Why do you think, um, from your, I'm curious to hear your perspective on this because I've been involved with, you know, uh, implementations that have started off great, you know, being on, having been on the customer side. Um, and then they die out and I know why those died out or at least mm -hmm. have a very good you know, reason why mm -hmm. I'm curious from your perspective, where, where do you see the failure, um, when it comes time to kind of figure out postmortem, you know, why, why is only active directory integrated with our IM system after, you know, two years, three years, whatever it may be. You know, I think that goes back to what the work you guys do. I always tell clients that, um, if you enter the partnership with us in advisory, our chances of success are much higher. And I think that is because we create executive support and more important. So when you say, you know, executive support, that's kind of like a buzzword. What does that really mean? What that really means to me is making them understand how difficult this thing is going to be mm -hmm. and making them understand that we're going to need the cooperation of the application owners of HR. We're going to need the application, the cooperation across the enterprise. And I think what happens in our projects, they used to, if you don't manage them correctly, they'll happen now is people get tired, yeah. right? The, the project team gets tired. They get tired of fighting the political battle. 
an Active Directory usually goes first. <laughs> it's supposed and to be it, one of the easier yeah. ones, right? <laughs> yeah. And the AD team is one team. You go and you bang one team on the head. But, you know, you think about people that are trying to onboard and, and bring into the identity program hundreds or thousands of applications. Man, that's a long, a lot of difficult conversations for one team to be having. Yeah. I think that executive support one is an important one because in my mind, that's money. I yeah. think and when I think about where I was, a, you know, a decade ago and really kind of starting to roll out IAM systems, you know, for, for the corporations that I've worked for, it seems like they were really only funded for a point in time, right? Mm -hmm. The next two to three years, mm -hmm. there wasn't really much planning beyond that, you know, and, and well, that's just something that you kind of have to think about is this is a program, not a project. Yeah. I, I remember having a conversation with a guy, you know, he was like a director level professional, super go-getter, you know, he wanted to fix things and he called me and I was really just giving advice because he didn't want to buy services. And he didn't want to buy product. It was, he had, he'd been given by Microsoft. I think at the time it was MIM or FIM. And he's like, I'm going to do this. And I said, look, man, I'm not trying to sell you anything. I promise you. But I'll tell you that if you embark on this journey by yourself, you were entering what I like to call a career cul-de-sac. <laughs> because you're not going to be able to do anything and people are going to have expectations because they're like, you've got the licenses for free. Why isn't this thing done? Mm -hmm. And you just aren't going to be able to do it on yourself. And I think that really resonated for him. You know, free enterprise software is not free. That's what I found. <laughs> you know? We see that a lot of times with, uh, well, as I've seen it personally with, you know, Oracle license are free from an IAM mm -hmm. perspective because they get databases or something like that but there's a lot of implementation that goes along with it. And there is that expectation as, oh, it's free. Why didn't we have it up and running already? You know, there's a little way, way more to it. And that really applies to any software. That's right. So, so back in the day, it was super hard. We were trying to solve a super difficult problem. We didn't really understand exactly where we were doing. This whole coordination in the, in the enterprise was difficult. And we entered into what Gartner calls the trough of disillusionment to the point that it wasn't just one meeting. It was, several meetings that I went into that my sponsor said, don't mention identity. You know, don't, don't, don't call this an identity project. And I, I was like, what do you want to call it, man? You know, it was, that was a, that was an interesting point in time. And then I remember being at an event and my good friend, I'll mention him again, Mark Potter pointed to a booth and he said, Oh, that's a Vexa. That's hot stuff. And next to Avexa was SailPoint. And I'd never heard of Avexa and SailPoint. You know, I had been um, competing with IBM and Oracle. Um, and I kind of ignored it. You know, I was never really a visionary. I was really, you know, I sold the cars that were on the lot and did what I had to do. But lo and behold, those names were going to become very close to me. And so I, 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 I really be started competing with. Um, and I think they played a major role in changing the story around identity. You know, so I'll keep going. I paused there for you guys to interject, but I'll keep going. So well, I was trying to think of a way to disagree with you, but no, you're right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was two, there were two of them. So, yeah. And, and at that same time, which was really interesting was there was something happened called Sarbanes-Oxley. It was just about at that same time as well. And this isn't my quote. This is, I was at a conference and I heard somebody say this, what, it must've been 12 years ago or so, that the best identity sales guys were Sarbanes and Oxley, right? They really got our space moving. Oh yeah. And it was at, and it was at the time where Avexa and SailPoint entered and pretty much what Avexa and SailPoint did was they said, you know what? This stuff right here that IBM, Oracle and CA are trying to do, that's really hard. You know, and that's not really where the value is. We're not looking for, we're not looking to make IT people's jobs easier. We need to keep the CFO out of jail <laughs> and we need to allow accountability for access to be moved from IT down into the business. And that's when the value proposition shifted from IT optimization to governance right to and and, and the, the sequel to governance or the symptom of governance is security right yeah Sox was a huge driver from from my background i mean it essentially doubled my team uh just 
<laughs> try to trust trying to manage SOX compliance, right? It's, so, you know, it's, it's in its basic form, it's very simple, right? Just make sure that the access is approved and that you keep a record of that. Exactly. You keep all your records in email and, you know, and, and, and older ticketing systems that really weren't easy to, to search for or like a generic ticket. It was super hard to try and demonstrate that to auditors that would come sit down at my desk and say, okay, here's these 30 people. Uh, you know, they've all been terminated. <laughs> Prove to me that they've been terminated. How do you prove right. a negative, right? The account doesn't right. exist. Right. <laughs> so you're having to look back through, you know, sometimes paper, at, you know, at that point. And yeah. it was just a total pain in the ass. And well, I think okay. one of the, the things that I remember from that period that Luis was talking about was that those come. I, I don't know who to attribute this quote to, but it's we still use it today. They talked about who has access to what. You need to be able to show who has access to what, and that's what their their solution specialized in, and it's that just resonated with everybody. Like, how could you argue with that? Well, I need to know who has access to what. Not only does that resonate from the standpoint of like, yeah, that makes sense. Everybody needs to know. But remember, now we're no longer trying to do the really difficult things. So it was like every identity guy just ran over to that and said, yeah, let's do this. Because, Jim, you know, even in our projects today, the aggregation of identities, right, the consolidation of the identities into the identity system um, and then correlation and doing the unique ID and cleaning the system. That's, I'm not a practitioner, but from what I've seen, that's much easier than trying to automatically provision with entitlements and permissions, right? So everybody kind of flocked to that, I think. Yeah, not everybody, though. That, that was just the one thing that I wanted to interject was mm -hmm. we spent the previous five years or 10 years training up the ladder that we need to automatically provision because there's no other way. I mean, that's, that's what we can do. That's how we can solve this problem. So there was a, a mindset shift, at least where I was in my career, that was happening kind of grassroots of managing identities that I started to get it and I had to, you know, move that information up because I was working for somebody who said, well, you know, yeah, cell point and VEX are great, but I need to, uh, you know, from an efficiency standpoint, I still need to do automated provisioning for thousands of applications. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, my, my feeling, and I, I feel like I'm going to say what you're going to say next was that mm -hmm. I think cell point of X, I heard that and they started to bolt onto their solution, the mm -hmm. ability to manage identities, right? At the same time, the big legacy vendors, the CA Oracle IBM mm -hmm. saw Hey, it's sale point and uh, of XR stealing our, our lunch. We need to start doing governance. So you see, for example, I was in a CA shop around that time or a little bit later and, you know, they had a governance minder product. CA mm -hmm. bought a, a, bought a company. I don't remember which one you probably Eure do. Yeah. Eureka Fi. Eureka Fi. Right. And then yeah. they said, we have governance minder. So but that was a bolt on. And I yeah. think the advantage was is easier to bolt on administration and provisioning or maybe not easier, but more sensical than to bolt on governance where you've been pushing out. Now you have to pull in versus you're pulling in. Now you have to push out. That, that's a really interesting point, Jim, because it's really like kind of the legacy products, how they've evolved over time, right? It's like all these acquisitions, the new drivers would arise. And I remember that happening with role engineering, you know, sun bought Vayu. Um, I think Eureka Fi might have been, I think Eureka Fi was actually the role engineering piece that CA bought. There was another one that was an Israeli company, IDM Logic, um, that was kind of the governance piece as well. And these things became really hard to manage because it was just bolted on. And, um, you know, even to this day, uh, I don't want to criticize too harshly, but IBM has a problem where, you know, their their product, their, old, their legacy product, the, two aspects of it don't don't work through the same interface as far as I understand. And it can, we're still living that in the legacy world. And now if you think about it, it's funny how in the software world, things repeat themselves, this issue with maturity of the products becoming legacy vendors. And we see it going on over and over. One thing I wanted to mention before we keep walking down this line here, the, 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 the hype cycle is that Jeff, something you said where your team doubled. 
right? When socks happen. Yep. To me, that's a direct indication of executive support, right? So not only did the problem get easier to fix, the products improved. We're on the second generation of products and now CFOs cared because they want to stay out of jail. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah, it's a big help, right? Yeah, keep the auditors off their back and, you know, they were happy. And, and I think every organization approached a little bit differently. You know, the mo most experience that I have, we decided to create centralized kind of IAM centers of, of excellence, right? Yeah. So things that were being disparately provisioned all around the enterprise, we pulled into one central group, common set of processes, mm -hmm. a way of doing things. And mm -hmm. then, you know, we had mm -hmm. a... We had a strike team, uh, mm -hmm. Leslie and Ray, if you guys are listening, uh, they went out and, you know, they were brought in specifically to help pull in SOX applications or uh, applications that were identified as having SOX relevance into our group um, and then just working through that. So there were, I want to say at least several dozen that kind of fell into that when you consider mainframes, I-series, you know, like kind of all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But there was definitely support to staff it. Mm -hmm. um, what I didn't really see as much support though was on the software side until it became a scaling problem where, yeah, we're going to have to double, triple, quadruple the size of the team just to keep pace with the volume of requests mm -hmm. as the you know, business continued to grow. Because when I first started, I, you know, we were on store 4,000 at Walgreens. Mm -hmm. and when I left, I think we we're at like 8,000. So we doubled wow. just the store count alone. If you imagine that's you know, hundreds of thousands of users trying to manage all that, you know, we definitely had to make an investment from the technology side just to, mm. just to keep pace. Yeah. And something Jim said, right. The, the provisioning requirements still remained right? and, and people were still doing that yet. I think, you know, these side projects around governance were going on. Even when people had CIA, CA, IBM and Oracle, they were deploying sale put at a VEXA in parallel to that. And we had two magic quadrants, right? We had the identity management, Man, nobody says I did any management anymore. Right? We had the identity <laughs> right, yeah. management magic quadrant. We had the governance quadrant. Yeah. Um, and then we started to suffer a lot of business disruption in the space, right? A, a Vexa got acquired around this time, I think by EMC and then EMC got acquired by RSA, the no, RSA and then EMC and then Dell. Um, you know, so, so, things started getting shaken up in this in this space meanwhile um bmc was falling off remember guy bmc had a product here and mm -hmm. sale point i guess acquired the bmc customer base or licenses i wasn't really close to sale point at that time so i don't know exactly how that went down i was competing with them but the net net is what jim was talking about was you know the products got integrated and you had I provisioning and governance in the same product that became a requirement and Gartner released the identity governance and administration quadrant, which is still what we're, what we're seeing today. And we were on our way kind of moving up that height back up to where we weren't a bad word towards the, the plateau of um, the plateau of productivity. You know, another thing that's happening in the background in this time frame time frame was major public publicly announced data breaches and yep. so we're also seeing you know i tj max of, and yeah tj max home depot things like uh, that uh target but you uh, also you, you know you'd have the the smart executive 10 15 years ago would say well you know you want me to invest a million dollars in security Show me how it's going to save me more than a million dollars. How is that a good yeah. business yeah. investment? But the shock factor of saying, hey, what if you suffer a, a data breach that costs you $300 million in brand equity? That, that wasn't even a conversation back then. Now it's like people know that that's, that's a reality, right? I mean, oh, man. It's, all over the, it's all over the news. So that's happening in the background, I think, more because one of the other things that you see you know, Gartner does a, a really good job. I think all the analyst firms do, but talking about how the investment in security is, you know, increasing every year. And it, it's just, uh, um, yeah. it enabled the industry to grow. And one of the other, I, I keep taking these sidetracks, but I think it's important to point out is that the identity and access management industry is always 
being driven by startup companies. So you, we talked about CA and Oracle. Neither one of the, those companies really started their identity management system. I think, you know, I was really more close to Oracle. They had some things. They went out and bought Oblix. Then they went out and bought Thor. So small companies that grew into big companies. And, you know, and you still see that today where this is an industry where you can start. It's a very small company, build, uh, you know, a killer technology and then get bought out by a larger company and added to a suite. And then sometimes those companies go, you know, take a sale point or an Octa, for example, they'll start as a startup and grow all the way and become a public company on their own. Jim, this conversation is great because I'm remembering things that I hadn't thought about in a long time. So about this time, you're absolutely right. People would come to us and they'd say, all right, this sounds great. Uh, can, you, can you guys do an ROI analysis? <laughs> and, and I'm not kidding. I yeah, look at the, we as sales guys, we would look at that guy and we would say, no, you're not ready to buy this. <laughs> we, really, we really did not do them and we ran away because this was a governance play. It's a yeah. security play. You, you just do this. You don't ask me for an ROI. So you took me back to the day there, man. It's all these cold yeah, shivers no. and bad memories. <laughs> yeah, one of my, one of my um, stories is, you know, we, the company I was working for eventually went out and we bought Oblix, which later became Oracle Access Manager. But mm -hmm. we tried, you know, trying to convince an executive they should spend a lot of money on, on a technology called Oblix that they'd never heard of before. We have to explain what it does and why it's a good investment and things like that. And again, Data breaches weren't in the news all the time. So we went back to the Oblix um, sales rep, who, by the way, was Tom Neckel, who had been at Identropy, who later up. Oh, I know was, Tom. Yeah, I was here a little yeah. while with him. He was here at Identropy for a while. Mm -hmm. um, he was our sales guy, and I asked him the same kind of question. I think he gave me the same cross-eyed look. But ultimately, their, the way they would build an ROI was, well, how much do you guys pay for a password reset? Oh, then, password reset. Now you're now you're yeah. going to the, the the you're digging deep in, in the in the album crate here, man. Yeah, that's right. That, yeah, password reset. We used to love that because we'd be like, that is ROI. There was tons of we justify yeah. the whole identity project with password reset. That's how I got into it. I spent way <laughs> too much time running reports, you know, trying to figure out how many passes we were doing, and it was just that's but that's that's exactly how how our started. And that's yeah. that's funny too because. You know, that is significant value to the business, right? Like that's an identity value proposition where the users are grateful. The only thing perhaps better is single sign-on. And if you remember back in this day, now I'm, I'm mixing Gartner quadrants, I'm missing, mixing sectors, but everybody wanted to do what we called enterprise single sign-on, which was single sign-on inside the organization, which was a pain. It was not easy to do. Yeah. And then things shifted again, right? It became more about web single sign on. It became and more things were active directory centric. It wasn't really single sign on. It was simplified sign on where you just use the same password over and over, but you didn't just automatically have access without authenticating. Yeah. You'd have like little listeners running on AD. They'd pick yeah. up a password change, right? And then yeah. push that out. So it really password wasn't synchronization. Yeah, exactly. You know, we spent a lot yeah. of time in windows genus, right? Trying to oh. make sure those things were working <laughs> right for the users. <laughs> yeah. So um, I, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, I, I know you guys don't want to have a two hour podcast. I know we could probably, um, how are we doing on time? Um, I think we got a couple minutes. I want to ask you a couple questions yeah. outside yeah. of this. And I want to yeah. ask you, the first one is, from a hype perspective, what's something that you see today that is either really overhyped or underhyped in your opinion? AI. AI, and is yeah. it over or under? Over, I mean, you know, so I think this is really interesting, right? This is actually, now let's get the plateau. So, you know, so what happened, right? These things became easier. Applications um, have programming interfaces now that we can go in. The synchronization problem became simpler expectations are less. So I don't want you to provision entitlements, not some do, but you know, I'm okay with you creating the account. So it got easier. The, the environment got less, got, you got more access to build these integrations. 
um, and we hit this plateau where we're just working. Like we can look at our clients and we can say it's going to work. We have, you know, 30 active projects, you know, a couple people might not be a hundred percent satisfied, but generally we're doing our jobs and we're coming in under budget and there aren't all these issues. So now enter this new era right now, right? Where everybody knows that the enemy is within. All right. Everybody understands insider threat. Everybody understands the walls are gone. Um, people are accessing our data from outside of our data center. So the old paradigm of firewalls and keeping people out is gone. So what's left for us, right, is identity. You know, if I, if everybody's coming in and out, at least I want to know who's coming in and out, where they're going. Mm -hmm. All right. And then, you know, these concepts of deep learning and machine learning and AI and all of this stuff that can process data more fat more quickly and look for behavior patterns that's the big promise we're all living right now and um to me that creates now getting us out of this plateau and starting a new hype cycle right a new hype towards behavior-based automagic provisioning and behavior-based uh, authentication and authorization and, and all of these things that I'm sure you're seeing as well. W would you agree with that, Jeff? Yeah, I think you probably were talking about things like adaptive authentication, right? yeah. traditional logic, yeah. you know, those types of yeah. things, right? Yeah. I wonder if it's AI is because there really hasn't been um, a real good application yet in the IAM space. Mm -hmm. I think there is logic, right? And you're trying to detect behaviors. I think that's probably just one phase mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. But I look at more from the end user side, right? When mm -hmm. am I going to go and say, hey, well, I don't want to trigger my things in here, but, you know, if I say Alexa or Google or Siri, mm -hmm. when are they going to, that natural language kind of input going to be able to infer, mm -hmm. you know, what I'm trying to do? And then how does it help me get access to what I need? What right. I need, you know, going forward. You know, so I think what we're seeing in AI that's not necessarily overhyped is you could apply AI within the product to simplify tasks, right? Um, repetitive tasks no longer need to be manual. There are things inside the product that are, are, are made easier, let's say. But the real value spans the product and it really creates, spans outside the product, it creates new product categories, right? So we're seeing the opportunity for integration between behavior analytics and identity governance, where identity governance tells us who has access to what and now we have to start caring about what people are doing with that access, right? Yep. So there's a whole new shift that involves identity, that surrounds identity, that's wrapped around AI and intelligence um, and, and machine learning that is going to force us to reevaluate our organizations that say, okay, I had identity over here and I had seam and behavior analytics over there these teams need to collapse or at the very least they need to start speaking with one another, which somewhat reminds us, remember when you said you got your strike team formed? Yeah. I think this, this is happening again. And I think it has to happen. Yeah. There's going to be obviously maturity in the, in the space as well. Right. So products need to find some way to, how, how do you make either get more value out of that or explore new avenues and, you know, re, you know, other ways to kind of get feet in the door to fix security things, right? Like blockchain, right? Everyone's been talking mm -hmm. about blockchain, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for IAM, I'm still not mm -hmm. quite sure where, where that's going to be fits. really applicable. Yeah. In an enterprise mm -hmm. situation, I understand mm -hmm. the benefits, right? You've got your distributed ledger, et cetera, mm -hmm. but how does that fit in an IAM space mm -hmm. beyond just a management of an identity, you know, that's maybe more self-sovereign well, type of things. Well, I think that's yours and Jim's job, right? That's what's yeah. so interesting because we sit somewhere between the vendor and the client our interests are aligned with the client always. What the client expects for us is to push them or pull them or help them really evolve, right, and improve. So once you're doing that, you're not no longer doing meat and potatoes, you're, you're really encouraging people to, to progress. So in that sense, we're moving towards the vendor, yet we're looking at the vendor and looking back into the customer and saying, well, we've never seen that done before. Right. right. And, and, and I think that that's really our biggest value proposition from an advisory and consultative perspective. Execution's huge, right? Chad and Wolcott who runs our services, his teams and screwing it in. It's like the two people you gave a shot out to. That's the super hard work. 
Mm -hmm. But I think our jobs also are extremely valuable to say, yeah, you know what? I don't really buy that. I don't really know if that's going to work, but we can try it and we can mitigate risk and we can do it in a pilot. Um, but we're not just going to sell you that hook, line and sinker. Right. All right. I think we should probably start to close it out here. Jim, do you have anything that you want to add? You know, I just, just the thought that I was having as you guys were talking about that, it seems to me that um, one of the areas where, uh, you know, Luis identified the AI piece as overhyped. I think it might be overhyped from the standpoint of whether or not it actually gets a foothold. But in terms of the promise of what it could deliver, I mean, I think that's the biggest threat to organizations is that they won't even know when they're breached. But the data is there. I mean, all these systems are being logged. It's just, you need yeah. the technology to piece it all together and put it on a dashboard to somebody to say, hey, something fishy is happening over here. Mm -hmm. Or to trigger some automated actions to disable accounts, things like that, potentially um, either identifying or preventing data breaches before they occur. So I feel like the, the promise of where, you know, hey, that the identification of, this is the potential solution to the main problem that we have. I don't think that's overhyped, but whether or not the technology of um, user behavior analytics really ever gets there. The thing that I've found that I think holds back technologies from really succeeding is any kind of lack of standards. So if the smart people or the, you know, the big leaders within the industry come together and form a group to set a standard like the SAML standard or the XML standard, you know, and people really adopt it. And there are a lot of examples of those standards that haven't been nearly as successful as the ones I just mentioned. Uh, however, I feel like that could potentially help drive so, things. Products build around those standards, then companies have an easier time adopting them. Yeah. So I agree. I think the technology is there, right? And it goes back to the same problem we saw with identity is that, you know, we work a lot with Exabeam. They're great friend of ours, great friends of ours. We picked them to integrate with SailPoint because they have a phenomenal product, phenomenal team. But the experience in the end user is what are the use cases, right? What are the data sources we're going to bring in? And in the intersection of Exabeam and SailPoint, you know, what are the use cases? What, how can we leverage this extremely powerful tool? Um, so I think it's organizational and the vendors push and lead the way. But, you know, I challenge our friends out there. They're doing the hard work in the IT teams, in the security teams, the practitioners to really consider. And, and they don't have time to do it, but to consider how can we cooperate with these other people? You know, and how, and how can we get our processes together? How can we make these different tools all a part of our program? And I know we're wrapping up, but I'll just say, you know, along those lines, an example of that is pretty much everybody owns MFA, right? Everybody owns a PAM tool. Everybody to some degree kind of has an IGA tool, be it, you know, an AD tool like Active Role Server or Oracle Identity Manager. The challenge is how how are we going to integrate those into our processes and how do we tie all those things together? And I know that's what you guys struggle with. And that's why I'll end the, I'll end my piece here where I started it, which um, I always have a great deal of um, respect for you guys that are customer facing in the account, challenging and helping people um, move forward. I think my job's a lot easier. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and going back to Jim's point, as and, uh, we'll close out here in a second. Yeah. You know, there's there's so much data out there that's just not being used, and I think AI definitely can help with that, or at least you know the behavior analysis parts of it. Um, there's an old saying, and I have no idea where I heard it or when, but there's two types of companies. There's ones that have been hacked, and the other ones that don't know it yet. Right? It's just there's it's just the way it works. So. Um, so I think with that, we'll go ahead and wrap it up here. Luis, totally appreciate your time being able to have a conversation like this is great. We hope you come back. And uh, yeah, thanks, forward. Luis. Hey, guy, it's a privilege. Just for the record, it is Friday at 4 p.m. And <laughs> you know, as sales guys, about this time of day on a Friday, we start we start you know 
wondering what we're doing here in front of the laptop. But it, to me, this was great. And, and thank you guys for having me. And, um, you know, have a great weekend. You've been listening to the Identity at the Center podcast. To access all episodes, visit identityatthecenter.com 